guys, it's Teresa. Welcome back to my channel. So if you're not aware, I recently reread all seven Harry Potter books in the span of a week. And because I delved so deep into this world, I obviously noticed a whole bunch of plot holes that I've never noticed before. I know that there are a ton of inconsistencies in this world, and many of them have been discussed over and over again. But today, I kind of want to talk about a few things that I think aren't really as frequently mentioned. So I decided to make a whole video about this topic. Just a little disclaimer, so I don't consider Pottermore or anything outside of the seven books canon because I know that J.K. Rowling tends to kind of like respond to plot holes with like making up stuff that would technically explain it but that was never like in the books to begin with. So I still think that there are plot holes in the books and you can talk about it all you want afterwards but I still think they're plot holes. On that note, I hope you don't take this video too seriously and like I'm like bashing these books. I'm definitely not. I love these books. I love this world, but I think it's just a sign of how much you enjoy something when you take the time to pick it apart and like look at it this closely to find the inconsistencies and the things that like just don't quite make sense. That being said, let's just jump right into this video. So the very first and probably in my opinion one of the biggest plot holes ever is the Polyjuice Potion. For the first time it is used in the Chamber of Secrets where Harry, Ron and Hermione take it to turn into Crab Goyle and unfortunately for Hermione a cat <laughs> because they want to find out if Draco Malfoy is the heir of Slytherin and has opened the chamber. In that situation Harry's and Ron's voices actually changed to those of Crab and Goyles. Similarly, in Book 4, when uh, Barty Crouch takes the Polyjuice Potion to turn into Mad-Eye Moody, his voice also changes into that of Mad-Eye Moody, so that would lead us to assume that obviously taking the Polyjuice Potion also changes your voice to that of the person that you have turned yourself into. However, in the seventh book, in the chapter to Seven Potters, when several of Harry's friends take the Polyjuice Potion to turn themselves into him so that he can escape the Dursleys safely, when Fleur Delacour takes the Polyjuice Potion and turns herself into Harry Potter, she still has a French accent. Now this is one of the, I think, biggest inconsistencies ever that has not really been talked about as much, even though it is glaringly obvious that this is a plot hole. The next plot hole is one of the most popular ones, so contrary to what I said earlier, I will touch upon it here as well, and that is the Thestrals. Now, the discussion here has been kind of like, should Harry have been able to see the Thestrals before Order of the Phoenix, where he actually does see them for the first time? If you didn't know, the Thestrals are horses that are invisible to all people except to those who have seen someone die and uh, obviously we assume that Harry has seen his parents die way before the start of the first book and then some people have argued that he has actually seen Quirrell die at the end of the first book even though I would say that that is wrong because he actually just passes out right before he died so he didn't technically see his death. But the undisputable fact is that Harry does see Cedric Diggory die in the Goblet of Fire, but then proceeds to take the horseless carriages back um, to the Hogsmeade station to go home. So technically, all things considered, he's supposed to be seeing the Thestrals at that point already. Now, in this case, I will quickly just touch upon what J.K. Rowling has said on this topic because she said she's gotten so many letters on this on this inconsistencies and she claims to have actually worked this out for herself before the book and she just never really put it in, which I think is sort of like a lame excuse if you ask me. I'll get to that in a minute. Basically, she has said that you have not only to see someone's death, but also to comprehend that they have a forever passed away and that they won't be coming back and once you sort of like reach that stage of like accepting that this person has gone then you'll be able to see the Thestrals. J.K. Rowling also claims that Harry has never actually seen his mother die because he was in the cot at the time and it just she, he just didn't see it and he was a baby, so I guess he couldn't comprehend it. I do agree that this explanation of J.K. Rowling's kind of makes sense, but I also think it doesn't clear it up completely. Like, for example, Harry and Cedric Diggory never had that much of a close relationship, so would he actually have been that bereaved by his passing? And even if 
even if we take into account that that was the case, it does not make any sense that Harry does not question this himself in the books at any point in time. He finds out in the fifth book that you can only see Thestrals when you've seen someone die, and yet somehow he takes this in stride and doesn't question why he could wasn't able to see them at the end of book four. I feel like if J.K. Rowling had already known this sort of caveat to the seeing someone die rule, um, when already writing the books, she should have made Harry himself ask this question and then it could have been answered and this entire thing would never have turned into a plot hole to begin with. The next plot hole is, I think, one that spans this entire world and it's mainly just a plot hole, maybe to me, I don't know, but the entire magical wizarding society does not make sense to me. Sure, in the books, People can do pretty cool things with magic, but are you really telling me that no one has ever been able to come up with a more efficient way of sending letters than using owls? When at the same time, in the muggle world, we have already gotten sort of inventions such as the telephone and sending text messages and things like that that are instantaneous and make it so much easier to communicate. Just think about the amount of times it would have saved so many people's like lives or trouble or time if they could just have been able to instantly contact someone and have a conversation with them. It seems that all manners of communication in the world are actually really outdated and they've just never come up with an easier way. I find it pretty odd that the only muggle invention that has found its equivalent in the wizarding world is a wireless radio. <laughs> there are so many better inventions that could have been adapted in some sort of magical way, like a magical telephone or a magical email account. And on the topic of letters, why are these people still using quill, ink and parchment to write literally everything down? Again, that is not the easiest way of taking notes. Sure, some people come up with like self-filling quills and stuff like that, but guess what? We already have those things in the muggle world, why isn't that just a staple in the wizarding world? In the same vein, transportation in the wizarding world is also such an unnecessary hassle. Apparition is pretty cool. Apparition is literally teleportation. And in the first few books, it's constantly being told to us you can only do it once you're 17 and if you pass your exam, makes sense, abide, great. But then in book six, for the first time, we are introduced to side a long apparition that could have saved so much time in previous books. For example, when Mr. Weasley takes Harry to the Ministry of Magic and he says, I can't apparate because I'm going with you, that's not true. He literally could have apparated and just taken Harry with him. Of course, we wouldn't have seen the cool telephone entrance to the Ministry of Magic, but if you just think about it, it would have saved so 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 much time along the same lines why is the Hogwarts Express even a thing? It takes actual hours to get from King's Cross to Hogwarts but then I think in book six we also find out that you can also just take the flu network to reach the office of your house teacher making the existence of the Hogwarts Express entirely obsolete. Also in the later books we find out that you can actually use Patronuses to communicate with people which has never happened in previous books even though it would have again been super handy for people to have the skill. And then the final plot hole that I want to talk about is Peter Pettigrew being a Gryffindor. Maybe that's just me, maybe that's just my personal assessment, but um, aren't Gryffindors supposed to be brave and loyal and put their friends above themselves? Well, of course, there's some people that take a little time to kind of grow into their bravery, but in the end, that's where they belong. And pretty much every Gryffindor that we know by name has proven their worth and shown us the reason why they were picked to go into Gryffindor in the first place. Peter Pettigrew is the biggest exception to this rule. He has never once in the books shown bravery. Not only that, but he's also shown multiple times that he isn't the most loyal person. He betrayed James and Lily to Voldemort. He switched allegiances as it kind of suited him. And for me, none of those sort of traits would place him in Gryffindor. And with these plot holes out of the way, I also just want to talk about some open questions that I still have that I wouldn't necessarily consider plot holes, but just questions that we've never gotten the answers to. Going back to Patronus's 
I have so many questions. First of all, in book three, we hear over and over again how advanced a spell Expector Patronum is, how many full-blown wizards still cannot perform it, and uh, how Harry is an actual miracle child for calling up a Patronus at age 13. By the end of the series, however, literally everyone in the books can perform a Patronus charm. I do understand that Harry tried teaching Dumbledore's army in book 5, and so I'm guessing some of these people will have managed to conjure up a Patronus, but that doesn't account for everyone, and I mean everyone, being capable of conjuring up Patronuses. Also in the later books we find out, as I said earlier, that Patronuses can communicate messages. My question to this is like, is this like an extra skill that you can learn? How, how do you learn it? How does it work? How can you even conjure up a Patronus when you're not faced with the mentors? Because in a lot of situations, the Patronus instantly disappeared after chasing away the mentors. So in what situation can you actually conjure them up? And who decides when they disappear again? In a similar vein, the mentors are also a big question mark in my book. Get it? Anytime anyone in the book is faced with a group of the mentors, their way of defeating them is to conjure up a Patronus to chase them away. That implies that they never killed them, so they just like flew away to somewhere else, but they're not gone forever. But then in one of the later books, when there's a mist settling around cities, we hear that that means that the Dementors are breeding, meaning that soon enough they'll have multiplied their numbers. So does this mean that at some point the entire world is just going to be infested by Dementors because there's no known way of killing them, but they also can procreate and uh, you see what I'm getting at here? This to me is such a weird situation and uh, I really really want some answers for this. A similar question would be what happened to the giants and Dementors after the Second Wizarding War. Both of their species were on the side of Voldemort attacking Hogwarts Castle, but then after Voldemort was defeated in the Great Hall, they're never actually mentioned again. Even though I doubt that they were all killed, because as I just said, as far as we know, Dementors can't be killed, and then I'm assuming they didn't just take them back as the guardians of Azkaban. And sure, some of the giants tussled with Grop, but I just don't think him being like sort of a smaller giant and a less powerful giant by himself could take on so many full grown giants and kill them all. So where are they? What happened to them? Are they going to be taken into the fold now? Are there going to be changes to the sort of hierarchy of magical beings in this world? That is a question that to me should have been answered instead of that horrible 19 years later epilogue. And that is where I'm going to end the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I definitely had such a great time rereading these books and I think it's the funnest activity ever to try and find plot holes because it's like you're being like Sherlock and you're looking at the clues and like, wait, this doesn't make sense, this is out of place. Definitely let me know in the comments below if you disagree with some of these plot holes or you have answers to my questions and let me know some other plot holes that you have found because honestly, finding plot holes is my favorite thing ever. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel for new videos every Tuesday and Friday and I will see you very soon. Have a lovely week. Bye!